Welcome back into the VHS Vault. I am VHS Chase. There is Jason Roy Gaston. And tonight we're talking some crow. Yes, the boomerang blade thing. That movie. Yes. The Patrick oh. Star of Death. SpongeBob, who's throwing me SpongeBob? No. <laughs> Think pointy well, thoughts, Patrick. Think pointy thoughts. <laughs> well, we got a new format tonight. Before we get to new format, though, let's just give our initial thoughts what we thought of this. All right? And I'm going to start. This movie is almost a good movie. Almost. And that's the, I think that's the best thing to say about it. If someone had gone into this movie, Jason, and cut 40 minutes out, we may have something resembling a movie, but we do not. It is My simultaneously. It is simultaneously the most expensive and impressive movie I've ever seen and the cheapest movie I've ever seen. It is full of amazing, fantastical locations and the same quarry 30 times. Um, it is not a good movie, but it has good ideas. Mm. There we go. And, and things that have been borrowed from other movies. And then, there's nothing original in this film, basically. There's nothing I original mean, in there's this There's just audience. nothing original in this film. So, uh, look, let's get into our new format. And we started off with what we call memories. Let's talk about the memories yes. of Grohl. Now, if you want to sell a film, right, to a kid at nine years old, put a five-bladed, uh, knife thingy in front of them and they are getting excited about it which means I was really excited just because of this thing and uh, I mean look it's a it's a beautiful weapon right and it's a cool idea I want uh, one in my kitchen <laughs> so I remember seeing the movie poster at the cinemas back in the old days when you actually have them in the cinemas on the walls there and uh, yeah I remember being super excited I want to see this I want to see this I want to see this I saw this and I reckon I fell asleep, to be honest with you. My memory is, and it might be twisted, but I remember being really bored as a kid with this film. Uh, my memories of this movie are very odd because I I know Crawl was released in, like, what was it, 83? I would have been six years old. I remember the commercials on TV. I remember the uh, the, the Xena Blade of Death. Uh, but it came and it went and it just disappeared from popular culture almost as fast and then it started appearing on the cable channels you know like i said a lot of the movies that i saw for the first time were on showtime because we just couldn't afford to go to the movie theater because we had to go like an hour to get there um i never came across this movie it just never popped up whenever i was watching tv and wow then one day I happened to turn it on and it was during the the penultimate scene in the palace where the, you know, spoiler alert, the Cyclops is getting smushed. And I remember watching this thinking, oh, my gosh, this is the most horrible thing I've ever seen. I'm never going to be able to stop thinking about this. And I changed the channel. And uh, <laughs> that was the last I saw I saw of Crawl until I was in college. And I happened to see a DVD at a Blockbuster. Blockbuster, by the way, is where they used to rent movies, children. Um, I saw I saw that and I thought, huh, I have never seen this movie and I often forget that it exists. Let me take it home and watch it. And it was not a good movie. It, it I hate to say it, but the movie kind of justifies its own erasure from culture because nowadays the only people who really think about this movie or old farts like us and people who are into very niche sci-fi fantasy. It's just not a good movie. No. All right, let's check out some, I've got a couple of bits of behind the scenes stuff to talk about. Jason, number one is this film was in development in 1980. So you imagine like Hollywood in 1980, fantasy films were all the rage, right? That was yes. starting to come into their four. And certainly uh, they decided to do, and this was an international budgeted film, which means it was funded by the UK and the US. So two countries um, lost money. Yeah, yeah, two countries lost money, big time. And so, like, the idea to come out with a giant blockbuster, 
I mean, I mean, you know, clearly they're influenced by Star Wars, they're influenced by Conan yeah. and, yes. and everything else, and they've kind of wrapped it up in this fairy tale. And, uh, yeah, like, so they're thinking they're on the winner. The problem is, Jason, from 1980 to 1983, how many bloody fantasy films came out? A ton. So many who did this story, particularly again and again and again. And um, I yeah, kept calling they... the princess Princess Vespa. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ah, princess Vespa, it is I, a gigantic puppet. Hello. Do I not scare you? Now, the other problem is, is they hired a director called Peter Yates. Now, Peter Yates is probably most famous known for the director of Bullet. Um, also films like Breaking Away. Yeah, very... Uh, Big director in the 60s and 70s. He makes a certain type of film. And they bring this type of director into a film which required, you know, momentum. And it had none because that's the type of director he is. He will leave the camera set on the most boring stuff for minutes on end. And this film, honestly, is riddled with it. So I think behind the scenes there, they just got the wrong person to direct it. Definitely got the wrong editor because they needed someone to come in there and go chop, chop city. And the other thing they they stuffed up, Jason, was the fact this is post-Star Wars. Star Wars redefined how to edit a film if you want to keep the audience engaged. Yeah. You know, and so there you go. That was some of uh, my behind the scenes. I, I just remember watching this movie this last time, just yesterday, and noting how poor the camera work was because yes. I noticed it was always on a tripod and the camera would move like this. Yeah. I mean, with shake that, and everything. It didn't have a ball gimbal tripod, clearly. Yeah, it was, like I said, simultaneously the most expensive and impressive movie, but also the cheapest looking movie I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I, I look, I agree. I mean, so, yeah, some of the scopes are magnificent. Like some of the... Like the photography of these mountain ranges and all that. It was great. But, geez, did we need to see 15 minutes on <laughs> All right, let's get into the plot of this film, if there's such thing as a plot for this film. Because I think we kind of wrapped it up. It's a fairy tale. It's yeah. Damsel it's in distress. Gets, yeah. Great evil wants away. to take over the world. King Arthur's court, I mean the glaive. A ragtag bunch of people who drop dead one by one as you get to your goal oh. comedy relief it is cookie cutter 101 yes, plot it's with this not original at all at all um but you know in saying that that's that can sometimes work to your advantage you know what i mean if you're a skillful bunch of filmmakers you can make simple plots work the problem is they don't make this work, Jace. No, this plot don't. at all. I mean, I really don't care about it, and the, and I think a lot of it has to do with pacing. And I'll keep repeating that this film is so unnecessary slow. It it's is. just shockingly slow. But the time, I think, the time that they start meeting up with other people, we're half an hour into the film, maybe forty minutes into the film, and it's just, you know. The only good thing about the plot, I would say, is the second act when they do introduce the characters. I don't mind some of the back and forth with some of those characters, if I'm being generous. Well, it's because it's interesting dialogue. I think the worst part of the dragginess of this movie is that nothing that is being said and nothing that is being done is interesting enough to justify its own appearance in the movie. Mm. So much I'm watching this movie just thinking, get on with it. Mm. Get on with it. Let's finish mm. this shot. Get on with it. And even after, um, even after the the secondary characters were introduced, which I I have to admit, Liam Neeson instantly makes any movie better. It doesn't even matter if he's a meaningless background actor. And of course, uh, the the late great Robbie Coltrane. You know, just yeah. this gigantic dude just hanging out. There's Liam. Yeah. Look how young Liam is. And yeah, there's Robbie Coltrane. Look and look at good Robbie. You ought not have done that. <laughs> uh, we ought not have done that. Um, yeah. He goes from killing monsters to befriending them, and it's fine. It's fine. Mm. But yeah, it's just uh, it is 
plotting it and is. pedantic. It's just not a good, the, not a good the, one. the worst thing is there's no – the finale is, is an example of a horribly executed finale because it's – I mean, if you're frustrated enough, there's – at the end of this plot, the end of this movie – when really he could shoot fire out of his hands because of the power of love. Man, like, this is where basically the movie's just sticking a middle finger up at you. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, he didn't need the Glade at all. At an all. Hour, an hour of this movie was unnecessary because the dude can firebend. Yes, he could firebend. He, he fire, could have owner, saved owner, probably owner, everybody owner. in this process as well. Meaning he cost people lives. Yeah, he got and Liam Neeson like, killed. You're joking. You you're... squished a cyclops. You squished the, the sweet cyclops. So Bobby in this Coltrane world also, died Jace. for you. Yes. You betrayed your remember... uniform. <laughs> and also remember, fire only hurts monsters, I think, in this universe. Because so... <laughs> nobody else gets, you know. No, no. Well, you know, it, it was an expensive. Uh, it was an expensive suit that they had to put yeah. together, and it was. Uh, uh, this... It was. Yeah, it was the first. Uh, it was the first. Um, I don't. I don't know. What you call it. it was the first robotic full body suit that was ever built for a movie. By the way, so yeah, that, oh, really? there's there's something for you. There was a behind the scenes tip. It you should have done that in the last segment. Now. <laughs> No, but really, there is some also, as this movie is unfolding, there's some pretty interesting visuals in this. There are some ideas I didn't mind. The whole idea of that castle kind of being almost connected, a bioorganic, surrealistic, like, I don't mind oh, some, nice. as, a, as a, like, I think, okay, I don't mind that shot. That's I like how they've It done looks that. like an 80s music video, but it's still, it does. right? I love how it was just this, Almost like a biological structure. Even you know, you see behind yes. me, you see bones and everything like that. You know, yeah, you've, yeah, you've got yeah. the heart room, the kidney yeah. room, you've got the stomach, you've got yeah. the butt hole. How you get out, by the way? It's just, uh, it was just incredible set designs and mostly miniatures too that they did with, uh, with yeah. blue screens. Yeah. Uh, something the George miniature Lucas works do, really great. Oh yeah, something George Lucas would do with uh, his Star Wars prequels. I really, I thought this was this. Location was honestly the good. highlight of the whole movie. Yeah. Just because of its it was one of the few things in the movie that didn't feel totally derivative of something I'd already seen before. Yeah. hundred percent. A hundred percent. The thing is with this movie, it's like, who is this made for? This is not made for the younger kids because there's a fair amount of pretty full on violence, including what I think was the most disturbing death in this film is that when they're in that hallway this hallway here the oh guy God. on the right the guy from braveheart i think that is he gets stabbed through the stomach and they show it slow motion slowly like, slowly not slow motion but slowly yeah, just slowly and i'm like wow yeah. wow you couldn't have moved five inches to your left that's right I mean, right. I, all, you would have had to, all you would have yeah. had to have done was stand like this and sideways and you would have been fine. But no, it's like, oh, no, it's coming right for me. No! You mentioned the Cyclops death earlier, too, and how yeah. overly disturbing was that edited together? Because... They, they kept ramming it down your throat. He's getting squashed. His head's getting squashed right now. And the only thing missing was an eye, the eyeball popping out through the gap. Well, it's thankfully good taste prevailed, but I did hear the bones crunching. Yeah. And the whole time right. it's like, it's okay. This is how I was supposed to go. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God, no. I changed my mind. <laughs> With my last breath, I curse Ken Marshall. <laughs> I'm going to defend this guy a little bit, though, because I do think I liked watching him as a character on screen. I, he was my favorite character. Yeah. I even did really enjoy watching what he had to say. Even though he creeped out the person who was watching the movie with me and actually, like, 
the person who's watching the movie with who said, I can't watch this movie with that guy. I'm out. And he got up and left. I was like, What's wrong? Well, I don't know. There's just something about him that's just creeping me out. And I'm going to be seeing that face when I try to sleep tonight. But yeah, he was he was my favorite character. I, I've always yeah. loved the the gentle giant type character, the, the one who yeah. is powerful and yet at the same time chooses kindness. That's always going to be one of my favorite characters. You know, you know something else is horrific in this? Every time a bad guy is killed in this, that scream. That and the fact that they're... Thing. Yeah, it explodes out of them. It's like butt bugs from Star yeah, Trek. Yeah, exactly. Other Why villains. did I not make that connection? Oh, my God. <laughs> but there you go. Um, but, yeah, it's... We've had um, enough of the butt bugs today. And if you're a young person, right, maybe you're 13, 14, and maybe this is who they were targeting, and you go in and see this, with that poster, with that bloody boomerang, and you don't see it for about an hour and 45 minutes in action. Well, you see it, but it's like, yes, I finally it's, got it. it. Well, you can't use it yet. <laughs> you can't, you, you'll Thanks, know Obi-Wan. when. <laughs> How will I know when? It's the end of the third <laughs> act. You'll know. <laughs> You'll know. And what you'll are you hear, gonna, what's you'll your hear most a disembodied voice use say, use the glade, Ken. Use the glade. Yeah, use the glade to, if you want to lean to your left a little bit, and spend five minutes watching it be an angle grinder cutting a doorway through. Bo- <laughs> oh, hold on. Because that's on, how spe- <laughs> Yeah, and it- there is so much of that. He in has this so, film. he's always smiling when he does. He's. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, yeah, here it is. It's like he's it's like he's coming to climax or something. It's like, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, like no, it's... he's doing it again. And it's odd, like it's just the way it finishes the whole Yeah. Like the sh- oh, Love Fire, fire saves the day. Yeah. <laughs> fire bending. Like, you know. Oh, no, the lure got stuck in the fish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like oh Bob, help. Oh. It's Doug SpongeBob. And then uh, for some mystical, magical reason, the whole building just gets sucked up in the air. Well, you know, it's the planet king. Not to anywhere that we get to see. We just see it go flying in the air. It could fall back down again at some point. I mean, it was kind of a cool, you know, it's not falling apart. It's falling up. That's kind of yeah. neat. Yeah, kind of neat, but it was so obvious. Um, By that point, that's I, I think with the, if, if we were to give it right at what kind of plot it is, this is about a two out of ten. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, because it is so derivative. Um, and anything they try to bring new into this film just seems disingenuine, just seems mean too. If you think about the ideas they introduced, all kind of pretty sinister, mean ideas, which you're making a fairy tale. What are you doing? Yeah, no, um, I'm right there with you. Honestly, I can forgive the derivativeness of the plot. It's just it's boring. Be bad. Be great. Make me angry. Make me happy. Don't bore me. I would rather sit through Batman and Robin than be bored by a movie, which I actually watched Batman and Robin last week. That's what I thought. We'll have to do that. You know what killed the dinosaurs, Batman? (laughs) The Ice Age! (laughs) I'm going, no, it didn't. I thought you were a doctor. (laughs) Doctor of. This um, I don't know where we're at now. I forgot. I, I spent the days up. Forgot. But you know Welcome what? To that's what it's why, like being in my brain. That's why we have bumpers, and we'll move on to the cast. Let's have a look at the cast and crew of this. We Absolutely. kind of mentioned the main guy, Ken Marshall. Ken Marshall, he's kind of recognizable, but I never saw him in any other film besides this. So let's see what else he was known for. Hey, you betrayed your uniform. Oh, wait a minute. It's Michael Eddington <gasps> from Deep Space it Nine. Is. How did I forget Michael yeah. Eddington? I didn't put the T. He was still so different in this. Well, he lost his hair and his beard. Yes. Now, I, I said before we started filming, yes, I'm kind of surprised Eddington. Ken Marshall did not become a bigger star because he had this really roguish good look to him. Uh, the acting was not great, but in his defense, the script was not great. And there's only so much an actor can do with a script. Well, well I don't think he, he kind of sp- resembled yeah. a young uh, Harrison Ford as well. So he could have been discount Harrison Ford. I, I just, I don't get it. I don't get why he was not bigger than what he was. And I guess it was this movie failed and everybody's like, let's blame the guy who was in it. 
No, he was just, he was just a dude doing a job. Don't blame him. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, he was good. Now, like, we've got some half-decent British actors in this film. Um, we certainly do. So, But, really, the two standouts that are worth really talking about is who we've already mentioned. Liam Neeson, Robbie Coltrane. Yeah, kind of odd to see them here in this film. Hello. But uh, the person who she feel ripped off the most because... This character, the princess, and she's a competent actress. I'm not saying that she isn't, but that holy Anthony, moly, the, that performance is rough. Is it sad that the thing that I remember her from more than this movie is Dracula dead and loving it? Yeah. <laughs> she was great go. in that movie. Yeah. I thought she was hilarious. That's, she's a competent actress, but oof. Woeful, yeah. woeful. You know what but, would have uh, been yeah, great? It was what, what, what would have been great is if instead of doing the whole firebending thing for the last scene, if, uh, you know, nothing can beat him, not even the power of love, then maybe it's my turn. And here comes Liam Neeson back in his, you thought you were dead. I got better. Well, I believe you and I have some unfinished business, Mr. Hatfield. Let's go outside. And then it just cuts to outside the castle. You hear a scream and a crunch and Liam Neeson walks away. She's all yours. And he, she, he just walks <laughs> off and you never see him again. You know what? We should make that another segment on this is how to fix the movie. Because yes. I think that's that's exactly what you did then there. You fixed the bloody movie. Get rid of Lizette Anthony, make it Liam Neeson. Liam Neeson <laughs> and Ken Marshall. That's it. Um I've this I've guy searched here. all over the kingdom for you. I know. I was here the whole time waiting for you. Incidentally, the bad guy's dead. <laughs> I killed this it. guy here on the left, the little magician guy. I thought he was at least okay. Very British humor in this, but not like yes. subtle British humor, not like over over the top. But I thought David uh, David Batley yeah. played Ergo the Magnificent, and um, quite honestly, I was racking my brain trying to find trying to figure out where I had seen this guy before. Because I'm like, I have a time bandits or something. I have a very distinct memory of this man, and then it hit me. He's the school teacher from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory who closes school. Of course school. he is. Yeah. Of I was just course thinking, wow, that's great. <laughs> wow, wow. That's – and it would have yeah, been only was, 10 years apart. It was only 10 years apart. He's a apart, very funny guy in this movie, though. Yeah, I, yeah, he, yeah. he could have easily been a character you hate, but yeah. I really enjoyed him. Every time he was on screen, I was like, yeah, I like this guy. Oh, sorry, Bring this in some off. levity. This is off brand, but I've got to show this image. Yes, pr more proof that fire doesn't hurt or lava does not hurt you. Yes, that was planet. totally lava. I <laughs> totally believed that was lava. That's the part where I'm just like, this is simultaneously but, the most expensive and cheapest movie I've ever seen. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> we can't afford to comp in any lava effects, but we put but we borrowed some slime from Nickelodeon and we're yeah. gonna shine some red we lights put a nice on it. Little just red gel act like it burns, that. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear oh dear so the cast and crew all very competent cast have proven mo look, most of those people have been a lot better in other things than this so that's another big misfire isn't it like you couldn't get a, a talented group of actors and and get you know decent performances out of them because your actors director can was only crap, do so Peter. much sorry actors can only do so much with what they're given there we go. So let's move into what we call the takeaway. From that's a screenshot from one of the greatest films ever made, far as I'm concerned, Clerks Two. Um, yes, I I remember it from the donkey scene. <laughs> yes, that's, that's the one where Gene Shalit like quit watching the movie and like walked. Yeah, well, like yeah. I'm not reviewing this, and he left. It's a brilliant sequel. And then one he died later, I think. Probably yeah, yeah, it got weird. Yeah. Okay, so the takeaway I get from this is that. I would do anything to get in a time machine, bust into that editing room, and cut 40 minutes out of this. Because I reckon I could have cut something together that would make money, Jason. Yeah. So my takeaway is, wow, yeah. even, you know, in the what I consider, maybe just because of my distorted version of what my history is, some of the golden age of cinema, far as I'm concerned, 70 and 80s, we did get some crap out there and big budget crap. And this is definitely at the time. And I think still remains a big bucket of crap. I fully and totally agree. This movie is, 
I don't want to say bottom of the barrel, but it's at least in the bottom quarter of the barrel, floating on top of the lesser movies. It's the scum it, at the it, bottom of the barrel? Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's badly acted. It's badly written. It's badly edited. It's badly shot. It's got some good ideas, but good ideas do not a good movie make. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would give this a 2 on my most charitable day. Yeah, yeah. And you know, but I do believe it is salvageable. It would have been salvageable, but oh, they yeah. let it. Yeah. Ugh. There you go. But there you go, Jay. So we have ended our review of Crow. Oh. I will never see that film again. But you know what never film I Crow. will be seeing again next week, Jason? What would that be? Ooh. Part two of our new Evil Dead retrospective oh with Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2. The one that comes after Evil Dead 1, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now, yeah, uh, I'm well, really excited about we, that one. What's funny is we ripped this movie for being derivative, and we're going to praise the next movie for being derivative of its own prequel. Yeah, but because it's just deriving from itself, isn't it, really? Yeah. It's just yeah. eating its own tail in a way. Exactly. Um, it's a Ouroboros of horror. And but I'm if you've never it. seen Evil Dead 2, please go and watch it in the next week because... I think you're really going to enjoy our review of it, and it's a movie that, uh, gee, I've I've seen Jason every couple of years. I watch this. I just happen to watch it because there's a manic energy about the film that is makes it so highly watchable. It's been an age since I've seen it, but I'm really looking forward to experiencing the cinematic tour de force again and Bruce Campbell's chin, which is spectacular. I consider this part one of a two film story. Because this is part one and obviously part two being Army of Darkness, where I feel these two films are very connected. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. But the week after that, Jason, Mm -hmm. this was your choice. It's my choice. And what a choice. I love this choice. You want to tell the folks what we're watching? Absolutely. Uh, Two weeks from today, we will experience the cinematic classic, The Monster Squad. Oh, wow. One of my absolute favorite 80s movies of all time. I love this film. I love everything uh, about it. I reckon it was a sleeper hit back in the day, too, because I remember this film coming out. I remember seeing this film, and I remember people being surprised by how quality it was because it was set up to be like a real cheap, C-grade kids movie, and it ends up being awesome. So, Do you know... Yeah. Do you know that this movie was originally written as a Little Rascals movie where the Little oh, Rascals were going to meet the, the Universal Monsters? Well, there you go. He's so it was going to be a Little preview. Rascals reboot. He will repeat that again in our behind the scenes in two weeks' time when we do <laughs> the Monster Squad. So that was it, guys. Thanks for watching again at the VHS Vault. Please remember to send in your suggestions. That's super important. Absolutely. Um, that would be great. And, of course, most importantly, Jason, they need to be following you on Patreon. Absolutely. Uh, you do need to follow me on Patreon. And uh, as Liam Neeson would say, you should follow him on Patreon because if you don't, I will hunt you down. I will find you, and I will ask you why. There is information on how to get to that in the video description below. You can join for just $5 a month, which is nothing. Nothing. So let us have nothing, please. Please. All right, guys. We'll see you next time in the VHS vault. Ah, there you go. That movie was ass. It was was, It was a double scoop helping (laughs) of butt with nuts just sprinkled on it. So the nuts are rocks, and you're going to break your teeth if you eat it. Oh, well, I say bring it on next week. Dead by dawn, dead by dawn.